series uh, of intimate chats with important people in the industry. I've been lucky enough to... Intimate s- chats. Intimate chats, see? Uh, to sneak my way into the, the hotel room of the three guys from Rooster Teeth. We've got Bernie, we've got Gus, we have Jack. Guys, thank you very much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. So, uh, let's go back to the beginnings. You're, you're making silly videos about Halo with you guys talking over the top of them. Uh, all of a sudden, it takes off. It becomes an international success. What's, what's going through your head at that point? Well, I think any time that you start any kind of project, you have hopes for it. But I would say that the early days of Red versus Blue surpassed our wildest expectations about two weeks in at that point. Yeah, without, without a doubt. And so you, you get flown to Australia. Well, you know, you've, you've come to here, you've gone to all these different places, promoting this product you guys have made in your spare time. It, it, like, was there any expectation that it would like, ev- ever become that even down the road? Not even straight away, but down the road. No, I mean, not at all. I mean, we, you know, we always hoped, like, you can actually hear on the very first recording of our first voice lines, we put it up. I didn't have enough audio equipment yet. I just had a video camera. Yeah. So I recorded Gus and Jeff doing their lines. And the first thing is them me hitting record and them going, what is this for? Why are you recording it? I said, well, you never know. This might turn into something and we might want it for like bonus stuff, whatever. And Jeff goes, you mean like a behind the scenes thing? And I go, yeah. And he goes, oh, that's, a, that's a cool. Good idea. And it's like, it's like you tell we're like, even in that, like even preparing for something like that, how naive we were. But both Gus and I, I mean, neither one of us had been outside the country before we started RBV. No, I got a passport specifically for my first. Hey, I don't want to hold the mic for you. You're going to have to hold the mic. This feels awkward. There you go. Give me, give me that. Uh, so I got a passport specifically for my first trip to Melbourne back in 2004. We did a, a screening here at the at Acme, just yeah. down the road. And uh, I, I'm still using that passport now. It's my fifth time down here. I'm, 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 it's about to expire. I feel a little like weirdly sentimentally attached to that passport because like over the you know it's like I got it because of Red versus Blue and because of Rooster Teeth and I've filled it essentially going around the world simply promoting this project and talking about it. Do you it. have any stamps in that that are for anything but Rooster Teeth travel? Have we traveled out of the country for like personal reasons? No. Yeah, so that's like a no. like a catalog of everywhere you've been for Rooster Teeth. That's yeah, cool. absolutely. Yeah. You guys could like frame that and keep it as like you know, merch for later on. We can do replications of it. Yeah, guys, you're so sentimental. I, I, I feel attached to my passport. Wow. It's like the old kind too. You, they don't make them like that anymore. Only you'd be attached to like a government document, <laughs> like a form of some kind. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that sounds like something you'd be sentimental for. How about you, Jack? Had you ever been out of the country before or before Rooster Teeth? Yeah, yeah. When I was writing for Ain't It Cool, I, I went to Bermuda he doesn't want to twice. Hold your mic. No, it's cool. No, it's okay. I can do it for Jack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I went to Bermuda a couple times. I went to uh, the Caribbean once, and so uh, Canada a few times. But yeah, Does a Canada lot of, count though. I was gonna say yeah. none of those sound like they count as being outside the country. But yeah, we'll take your word for it. Well, now coming into Jack, now you you came on board, I guess, the second gen, if you would. You were you weren't OG crew. You were second yeah, gen. Yeah. How did it feel to come into, I guess, an established franchise like you know what the guys have done with RVB, make something like Achievement Hunter, work with the guys on videos for that, and make us the success that it was? Well, it's definitely intimidating because I mean these guys have been around for I mean they had been working together for seven years when I finally showed up, and I was employee like number nine or ten. And, you know, since then, we're up at, like, 56 or 57. Like, we have a whole lot of people that it really is the last few years. We've, like, exponential growth. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, this was a really tight new, tight-knit tight group of friends. And so it was kind of cool, like, joining into that and kind of being a part of that. And for a while, it took a long time for me to kind of settle into my own there, you know, kind of, like, feel my ground and kind of know what it was going on. And I think it's weird now to be, like, lumped in with, like, the original guys. Because to me, I'm still, like, you know, that second gen, you know, like, me, Brandon, and Monty all came in within about six months of each other. And, um, but yeah, even then, like, these guys, they've been around for so long, like, before I, and so, I don't know, it's was, it was weird, but it's, def- it's kind of cool to be part of that, but now it's like, we have so many new people, it's like, we, I, I don't even know everyone's name at the office anymore. <laughs> you're that like, guy, oh, everyone like, oh, that's, and you're like, oh, yeah, hey, oh, yeah, hey yeah. buddy, yeah. Yeah, over time, those distinctions matter less and less, like, I mean, Jackie, being seven years apart, it's like, doesn't seem, to, it's like different generations of the company where we work on different things, and now Achievement Hunter being such a critical part of the company, it's like, it's, it. That's what matters more than anything else. Yeah. I mean, when I when we first started Red vs. Blue, I was like the old guy because I was so much older than <laughs> Gus and Jeff. But somehow now we're all the same age. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Like we we caught up. Yeah. Somehow or some way. So and, and that's the other thing as well. So you've got Rooster Teeth. You guys do a lot of the creative projects. The the RVB. Uh, you've got Ruby coming out, and then you've got Achievement Hunter, a very different kind of thing. It's it's about video gaming specifically, but more you know, let's play videos, um, Achievement Hunter guides, maps, that kind of stuff. Was it was did you ever envision the whole project becoming I guess the, the dichotomy there or was it just the natural progression? Uh, Jack can obviously answer this more in depth, but uh, initially when it started, it was supposed to be something different. It was supposed to be more of a celebration of direct video game culture. But I think you guys have done a tremendous job 
of kind of going back to the heart and soul of Rooster Teeth and making it more narrative. I always say what sets Rooster Teeth apart is the personalities behind it. You know, anybody could pick up a copy of Minecraft and record themselves playing it. But when these guys do it, it's, you know, two to five million views when they do that. And there's there's something to that. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of the things where, you know, we're not a traditional serialized show, but there is serial elements to everything we do because, you know, we'll have conversations where, you know, you know, at some point Gavin will get kicked off Team Lads and then like three or four more videos will, get, will mention that and they'll be like, okay, you're back in later on. So it, like if you do watch everything we do, you do kind of catch a little bit of that. And, you know, you definitely watch. You, I mean, you can watch us grow over the years as we've done all these different things. And uh, Achievement City is a great example. Achievement City itself is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see, like, stuff we built up and just keep getting bigger and bigger. So it, it's kind of it's, it's neat because it didn't we didn't launch it as that. You know, that wasn't the idea. The idea initially was, honestly, to do, like, tutorial guides and, like, videos and help people out in video games. We, like, do, like, a game facts on, like, in video with some personalities that's, yeah, that's, that's what I always meant. I mean, the, the title itself, Achievement Hunter, would, would denote that that's what the, the, the original yeah. focus was. And that's, that's exactly what it was. It was just us, like, showing how to do, you know, how to get achievements in video games. And then we realized shortly, you know, after about a year or so of doing that, that there were points where there would be no new games. And it'd be like, okay, well, what are we going to do this week? There's no new releases. And so that's where Awu came from. That's where Fails of the Week came from. And Horse and these, these shows that, you know, whether or not anything comes out, we'll still have content to put out that week. And now we've got something like probably 15 shows scheduled throughout the week across our Let's Play stuff and our normal Achievement Hunter stuff. So it's just, and, and then we do the guides on top of that as well. So it's, there's a lot of content there. And, and going back to the you know the, the, the RVBs and things like that, the, the planning that goes in it is much different to something like the achievement. You guys obviously have to script it, plan it, shoot it all in one hit. Has the process changed that much since the original days? Uh, you know, it has. Um, season 10 was probably the first season of Red vs. Blue to be completely scripted before we even shot the first episode. A lot of times we had major, we had a big bookends for the season, where we started and where we wanted to end up. Uh, and then we had major milestones along the way. Uh, and we never really wrote beyond any one milestone. Like, we'd write four episodes at a time at the most. But season 10, we just scripted the whole way through. And then we, once we brought on the animators, um, you know, and everything else in season 8, a lot of their stuff had to be scripted well in advance. Um, and so, yeah, th there's always been a, a constant evolution. I think at Rooster Teeth, the big secret to our success is that uh, we've been very adaptive. Um, we haven't always been the first anything. We were late to YouTube, but we've always adapted to things, you know, and tried to... Uh, make productions that fit in with whatever the current environment is for online video. Well, speaking of which, you were saying about animations. Now, obviously, when it started, it was captured specifically in game. It was it was everything that you should do, and the limitations existed to what was in game. Later seasons, of course, you guys introduced CG elements. Mm -hmm. Was that was it something that you figured had to happen, or did it just it just seemed right at the time? Well, when we first started doing it, uh, we made a conscious effort to make it uh, anything that like we realized a lot of younger people were watching it, and they would want to and you know become inspired by it and we thought well we want to have it as much off the shelf as possible uh and that was important to us early on what ended up happening uh was the machinima movement exploded but it wasn't a coincidence coincidence that most of machinima was in halo and so then it became very difficult for us to differentiate our content at least on a visual basis from all the other um you know people we had inspired and and you know and we always thought we were you know, kind of at the vanguard leading this content. So we had to kind of push ourselves and do new things. And then we started doing the animation from that. Well, speaking of the characters as well, obviously we followed their progression from, you know, uh, Gus and uh, Jeff sitting in the canyon talking about life and the existence right through to vast government conspiracies and, and what is the meaning of being on Team Red, Team Blue. Is it just going to keep, like, are you guys going to just keep adding layer and layer? Are you happy where the characters have gone? Well, I think, you know, it's, uh, I consider Red versus Blue to be a sci-fi show. And it was the run of Red vs. Blue has gone over now the full run of Lost, which I think was a big revival in the sci-fi yeah. genre. And, but Lost was an interesting show to me because Lost turned the sci-fi genre into kind of the mystery genre yeah. in that you were you're always trying to like fool the audience and the audience had to figure out what was going on. And it added like a gaming element to sci-fi. And a lot of shows had that. Like Battlestar Galactica had like who were the Cylons and like there were these things that had to be solved. Uh, I never really had that with RVB. I thought we were telling a pretty straightforward story just over a long period of time. Uh, and then I found the audience was adding these gaming elements themselves. They're like, who's this person? What's this? And they were trying to build these conspiracies into it. Um, but one of the things that always aggravated me about Lost was you would get to the lair where these people know what's going on, on the island. Nope, it's these guys. And you're like, oh, they know what's going on. Nope, now it's the people of them. And it just kept going up and up. You can always add another layer on top 
Yeah, that's not what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I guess, Gus, like, how, how do you feel, like, being, you know, OG, you know, f first generation, your character Simmons, obviously, yeah, the, the character you're known for, I mean, are you still happy, you know, getting behind the mic and voicing him every so often? Yeah, absolutely. The one thing I say now is I will never say yes, sir, again. Anytime that's in the script, I tell him, I've said that for 10 seasons. I'm sure I've already said it the way you want. Go find it. <laughs> well, and I guess that, that is the thing that you've got to look back. I mean, you guys been nearly 10 years would and you guys have been doing it. it does it ever do you ever think oh, I have to do this thing again or is it still you know the sparks there you still just get up get out there and do it well I think the it, I, I never have a problem having to do something uh, and I think that comes from the fact that our jobs are so diverse like there's no rut there's no typical day at any given day I'm doing something different working on another project so even if I have to go back and you know re-record a line or what you know whatever it is it's not stale. It's not like I've been doing this all day. I'm not sick of it. It's 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 always something new going on. Of these characters, I mean, initially when we started the show, it's eight guys that all look the exact same. They're just slightly different colors. Yep. And so we had to make characters that were really strong from the get-go so that people could identify with them and differentiate them yep. on screen. And it's funny because now our head writer is Miles Luna. He's writing season 11. Yep. And the conversations we have, we know these characters so well specifically in regards to Simmons, there was a line in the script where he was, uh, Griff said something to him and he made a comeback at Griff, but the comeback got longer. Like, he, like, it was long. It was like three lines long. And I had the conversation with Miles. I said, I like with Simmons, when he has a long comeback, the longer it is, the more likely it will fall apart and Simmons won't be able to, to like, deliver it because he'll just fuck it up. Yeah. And then Griff, it'll turn into Griff making fun of him again. And, like, Miles goes, absolutely. Like, he, he understood that because he knows the characters so well. The na yeah, the natural foil kind of thing, I guess. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I guess, you know, you guys have expanded even beyond that into the, into the community. You guys have this Roots to Teeth Expo. You come to events like PAX to, you know, at the, the, the sci-fi conventions out here. Again, are you just amazed at how many people are willing to A, pay money to come and see you guys, and B, just get behind you guys in as, as strong a way as they have? You want to answer that one? Uh, sure. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's always, like, super humbling to see people uh, who've traveled and, you know, who, who've put themselves, like, out of their normal element to come to come see us. Uh, and we're always, like, super appreciative of it. Like, even when we had uh, RTX, you know, this summer, there were quite a few Australians who, who flew up and made that trek out there. And, in fact, when I was flying down here, uh, on the first leg of my flight in the U.S., there was someone who was coming back home to Sydney, and then on my uh, and, and then when I was in the Sydney airport, I ran into someone else who was coming out to Melbourne, who was got his way back from RTX, yeah. and uh, it's 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 still you know even after ten years, super humbling, and we're so grateful that people are, are willing to come out and see us and support us and you know watch the great and watch the content that we put out. I, I guess it goes back to Jack's uh, side as well, the the achievement hunter side. Have you always had fairly decent feedback from the community from that side? Well, yeah, I mean, the community feedback is always great, but something something like RTX or PAX, what, what's great about that is we can actually put faces to people where, you know, we put, we produce all this content, put it on YouTube, and then we just see a number. And we see that number going up. It's like, okay, it's like, you know, a million views. That's cool, but then if you get into a room with a thousand people that are watching a video, like, that's, it's amazing. And, like, having that, that user feedback is something that you just can't replicate. I remember in the early days of the forums, whenever we wanted to have a community event, I said it'd be a great idea if everyone had their avatar picture on their shirt because it's like yeah. I could identify picture people based on their avatars that they use for the forums, but it's like then you finally put faces to these fake pictures essentially. Yeah. Well, it, it, people do that now with Twitter badges. They'll say I am such and such from Twitter, and it's, it's a great like, idea. See, it's, yeah. it makes sense. I guess if, a couple last questions. If there's one moment in, in your whole time working with Rooster Teeth, what's that one moment that kind of just you always harken back to as like the golden moment for you? Man, uh, Bernie, go. <laughs> uh, mine would be uh, uh, with the, when they, the Wall Street Journal did an article on us, and they had me turn in a picture so they could make that little pointillist like version, the portrait yeah. they put in the Wall Street Journal. And I remember the guy called, and he just like very casually said, "Hey, just want to let you know the article is going to run tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be on page one." So like, he left a message, and I call him back. Go. When you say page one, did you mean? Like, like the page <laughs> one or like page one? And he goes, no, it'll be on the cover. Like, so I think being on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, that was like, I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. I thought it was amazing. Not only that, but the, o the other picture on the front page, I believe, was the CEO of Coca-Cola. Right. And you were the picture above the fold, and your story was on top. And you had to look at the bottom of the page below the fold, and there was the Coca-Cola CEO <laughs> and his story. It's like you were on top of him, like one of the biggest companies in the world. Right, right. And uh, I thought that was amazing. Uh, for me, like this... This goes back a little maybe to a community uh, and like seeing people who are, are fans of your work. One time we were doing uh, a film festival in London 
and I was out there with Joel and Jason, and we were by the London Eye, you know, the big yeah. Ferris wheel. And uh, Joel and Jason wanted a picture in front of it for some reason. I was like, okay, fine. So they went out and stood by it, and I, you know, went back a little bit, and I took a picture of them. And then there, I realized there was a guy who was walking in the background who recognized us from the website. And this was like in 2005. And came up and talked to us. And if you look at that picture, it's a picture of Joel and Jason from the London Eye with a guy behind them going, <laughs> like giving them a strange look. Like he, that moment of realization was captured in that picture. And, and he was a guy from Japan who was visiting London for something totally unrelated. And like he just happened to recognize us, you know, in the street taking a stupid tourist picture. That's very cool. Yeah. How are you, Jack? Uh, I I don't know if there's any one particular thing, but one of the most surreal moments I had was uh, Joel and I were in Las Vegas a few years ago, and uh, we were at a craps table in like the Aria Casino, whatever. We was playing craps, and um, at the end of the night, we finally we you know we cashed out or whatever, and so the guy slid us across our chips, and he's like, "Here you go, Jack. Here you go, Joel." And it's like, we never said our names. He's like, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a fan," and he had been he had been standing across from us for like two hours, and it's like, whoa, that is it's so it's still surreal to this day. It's like to to think that you know people spot us out there it's just it still blows me away and i'm still just, you know confused by it like even coming in here when i was in sydney going from sydney to melbourne uh we we had to like transfer a terminal and i walked outside and there was a guy wearing a tower pimp shirt just like sitting out there and i was like oh hey man you going to pax and he's like no i'm just going to adelaide and i was like oh okay <laughs> cool wow that's weird you know it's, just, it's it's still like surreal and strange to me but it's amazing it's really really badass if i, if I can offer just one more answer to this yeah. so it's, i mean these are like things that are Really cool when you're, you know, working on something to get the recognition like that. Um, but there was a very early moment in Richard Teeth's history, which is important, I think, which was we were busy making movies and taking them to film festivals and trying to get these admission committees to show our films in the festival. It's basically the process of asking five people if you can show your movie to 200 people. Yeah. And we, w we did that for a year with one of our movies. And uh, we put up a video of Gus online um, and my buddy Matt, who is now back at Rooster Teeth and one of our partners there, um, he was working in L.A. And we put up the video. And before I could call Matt to tell him that the video was online and to check it out, it showed up in his office from another guy who was watching it on his screen. And it was like that was a moment that is kind of taken for granted these days. But it was that sudden realization we don't have to go through any more gatekeepers. We can go directly to everyone who has an Internet connection, which, by the way, is everybody. And it was just an amazing moment to realize the walls were falling down. And I think that that is the big shift. That's what the, the strength of you guys is. That you said yourself the adaptation. I mean, speaking of which, what is what's next? Like, what what are you guys hoping for? Five years time, yeah. You've got the, the, the grand Rooster Teeth five year plan. What what's, what do you hope to be? Where do you hope to be? Uh, well, I mean, my background is personally as a live action narrative filmmaker, writing fiction and then filming. Uh, fiction. Um, I, I love everything that we do and I want to see everything continue to grow, but me personally, I'd like to work on more of that. It's because of things like Achievement Hunter, things like the success of the podcast, it's now opening up those opportunities where we can kind of step back and develop those ideas, which I'm really happy about. What about Achievement Hunter? Well, it's kind of funny because, I mean, we're actually turning five years old next Sunday. So it's like to think five years from now, it's like five years ago we didn't exist, you know? So it's just... It's tough to imagine where, I mean, in, in five years, we've got nine full-time employees who just work on Achievement Hunter, and it's just like, all right, where the hell are we going to be in five years from now? So I don't know. I mean, it still doesn't seem like enough. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Rooster Teeth at 10 years, we have, what, like, you know, 60 people or something. So it's like, yeah. all right, so Achievement Hunter at 10 years, what do we look like? I have no idea. Hopefully, you know, making awesome content still and still enjoying what we do. So. Gus? Drunk. There you go. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, okay, that's easy. Um, that's good. It's good to have goals. But no, um, I guess, look, uh, thank you very much, guys, for taking the time to speak to us. Um, we wish you the best of luck with everything, the best of luck with PAX, and uh, we hope to speak to you guys again very soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. We appreciate thank it. Thank you.